I'm going to get right into it because we have a great panel here, and I'd like to leave times for uh, Q&A with all of you, so I hope you won't be shy when we open it up. Um, but I'm, I, I'm the moderator here. I'm Paul Fain. I'm a senior reporter at Inside Higher Ed, which is a digital news publication that covers higher ed. And um, the folks on this panel and some of you have kept us extremely busy of late. Um, I would say the busiest of my career as a higher ed reporter. Uh, it's been an exciting year so far. So I'm going to um, just very briefly read the names and titles here so you know who, who these folks are. And then I'm going to let each of them talk very briefly about what they do and why they're here. So directly to my left is Sherry Leader Kelly, Vice President of the Council for Adult and Experiential Learning, which we call CALE. Then we have Mika Hoffman, who is the Executive Director of the Center for Educational Measurement at Excelsior College. And then we have Joseph Tebow, uh, Director of Academics at Straighter Line. Um, then Mark Singer, Vice Provost, Thomas Edison State College. And finally, Devin Ritter, uh, Director of Special Projects at the Saylor Foundation. So I actually have written about each one of these institutions, I think, in the last month or two. So this is all very exciting for me. Um, so just, just to very briefly kick this off, um, I was actually at a kale conference uh, I don't know, a couple months ago, time flies, and we were talking about um, prior learning assessment, competency-based education, and I said kind of jokingly to the panel, it was the night of the State of the Union, if you could get the president to address these issues, what would you ask him to say or do? Little did I know that President Obama in his State of the Union in the supplementary materials actually addressed these issues and encouraged uh, higher ed and accreditors to speed to market these innovations, which was pretty shocking because it doesn't usually get that sort of airtime. And then Marco Rubio, in his response, in addition to the water thing, which I may do later, um, <laughs> actually was even more explicit, I would say, in supporting prior learning assessment. So exciting time. So I'm going to start with Sherry, if you talk about what you do. Sure. Um, I'm Sherry, obviously. Um, I'm Vice President for LearningCounts.org, and we are a nonprofit, currently foundation-supported um, online service that helps adult learners align their experiential learning and knowledge, what they might have gained at work, maybe um, in a MOOC or in volunteer uh, work. We have them align that with uh, college courses, currently a course match system, which is really kind of backwards in our view. but. It's what higher education recognizes right now. Um, they align their learning against the learning outcomes. And then we have an assessor who's a subject matter expert and a faculty member review the electronic portfolios and decide if college credits can be awarded. So students can come through. They learn how to align their learning, demonstrate their learning, and earn college credit, which helps them to significantly accelerate degree completion, get acknowledged for what they know, and to also um, save save money. Turn it to Mika now. Um, I'm Mika Hoffman, and I work at Excelsior College, um, particularly in the Center for Educational Measurement. We are kind of the prefab version of what Sherry does, yeah. which is that we build standardized assessments in areas where there are a lot of people learning that amount. Those standardized assessments are pegged to typical college courses, so interest psychology or criminal justice or bioethics. We have a number of these exams, and essentially what they do is they, it's the same as what Sherry does. You take an exam, you pass an exam. The exam content is pegged to learning outcomes for typical courses, and again, we translate performance on the exam into what would be expected if you had taken a course that's worth college credit. Um, we do, because we're a college, we transcript it directly, but you don't have to be enrolled in the college to take an exam. You can use that as credit anywhere that will take it. Oh, uh, I, I was <laughs> tuning out there for a second. Apologies. So uh, next up, Mark. For, for oh, sorry, sure. Joe. OK, I'll go. For sure. Uh, Joseph Tebow, I'm the director of academics for Straighter Line. We offer. Uh, the typical college courses for $99 a month plus a small or nominal start fee. And uh, I'm happy to say that we're partners with everybody here. <laughs> so do we have some very low cost options from Sailor and others um, that can, uh, student can take. It's a kind 
kind of more likened to a traditional online college approach, though it's self-paced, so students pay only for the time that they're using, and they can transfer that to either the American Council on Education Credit Network or to one of our three dozen or so partner colleges. Mark? Oh, thanks. Now, now it's your turn. All right. Um, I'm Mark Singer. I'm with uh, Thomas Edison State College. I'm the vice provost in charge of the Center for the Assessment of Learning. And what we do in that area is just try to figure out all the different ways we can uh, give students credit for what they already know, um, whether it's through uh, exams, assessments, um, whether it's through uh, portfolio development and assessment, or um, whether it's through an evaluation of the training programs or licenses or certificates um, that those students have earned um, outside, either in um, corporate training or the military or, or something like that. Um, and, and so we really see ourselves at Thomas Edison as kind of like the, within the colleges, like the Department of Flexibility. You know, we're just trying to figure out all the different ways we can um, map what students know um, to our degree programs and um, to, to sort of be as creative as possible in evaluating um, what they do. And we've also been working with the Sailor Foundation for about a year and as part of our whole flexibility thing where um, developing exams that will align to um, sailor courses so that a student who finishes the, uh, a particular sailor course can then take our, our TSEP exam, that's the name of our program. If they pass our exam, they get credit for the sailor course. Devin? Uh, I'm Devin Ritter. I'm the Special Projects Administrator with the Sailor Foundation. Uh, so all of my colleagues here have kind of spoken to the fact that we have a working relationship with them. And we kind of see ourselves as being the learning piece that fits in with the flexibility of their assessing that learning. Uh, so through various means, uh, we are taking our content and matching it up to the colleges and universities and organizations like Kill and organizations like Straighter Line who can benefit students by allowing them to take what they've learned with Sailor and actually transform that into college credit and hopefully into a more affordable college degree, which is something hopefully we'll start talking about a little bit more. So yeah, our first theme is, is credit-worthy assessments. And I, I, if, if someone wants to disagree that, that college credit is still the coin of the realm, please have at that. But, but let's start with assessments. And because I'm the moderator, I'll, I'll talk for a second because I'm allowed to do that. Um, <laughs> so as you all may have heard, in California, there's a, a bill that's been floated to, to create a pool of online courses to serve public stu students at public colleges. And the way that the legislature has proposed making these credit worthy is through direct credit. So basically, if you take, let's say, I'll just pick one randomly, a, a straighter line course, um, you would receive credit through the ACE credit recommendations that you could then use, as I understand it, at the community colleges or Cal State or potentially University of California. So, and, and by the way, as for context, the California community colleges turned away 600,000 students during their recent budget crisis. So we're talking about a lot of capacity. So on the other side, we just discovered yesterday that there's a bill in Florida to do a similar but different thing. And the details are still a little vague, and we're still trying to figure them out, as I think some folks are here. But to encourage colleges to use a pool of courses from outside providers, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but where the credits would actually be through assessments that I believe the colleges would manage, which is more of a direct assessment. So could you, could you all talk about those two methods and what you see as potential upsides of each method? Who wants to try first? Sherry? I'll try. I'll try. Um, well, actually, I think that what we're seeing, especially in California, is um, that policymakers and taxpayers are just tired of business as usual with higher education. And although Calif the California model is actually one that a lot of states wanted to emulate maybe 20 years ago, um, it became just so, so expensive and onerous that um, now, and you're, you're seeing a lot, a lot of governors do this, they're trying to find a way that they can somehow um, enable students to be able to kind of bypass the entrenched part of higher education and come around and still get the credential that's going to be recognized by the entrenched part of higher education, which is kind of a, a challenge that we face at Learning Counts in that students come to us knowing what they know and what they can do, 
And then we have to retrofit them back into the course match credit hour model so that it can go onto uh, a, a transcript and be recognized by all the colleges and universities. If we were able to move the other direction to simply competencies and competency assessments, um, that would actually serve the students better. And I think that's kind of in line with a lot of workforce development people are really asking for at this point. Sure. Someone else want to jump in? Devin? Yeah, well, just personally, my view on the, those two models, I think the California approach is more efficient and actually ties in what more people are doing. Uh, one of the benefits with that approach is it allows for a students to take online courses such as sailor courses or straighter line courses or hopefully a lot more courses where the students can be able to master the learning objectives that are needed in a college course. But the second part of that is it allows for the assessment of that by various means. So hopefully they can take courses that could then be assessed via Excelsior or Thomas Edison or a straighter line exam or a Kale portfolio and California will then say yes we will take that assessment because we've already had leaders in education prove and validate that you did that. The Florida model to me is great in that they're allowing students to save time and work on their own pace and learn online but they're taking a burden upon themselves of having to do the assessment which is understandable in some means because academics like to have some of that freedom to test themselves uh, but I think hopefully in seeing and Mika can speak to this probably, the incredible detailed approach they go to exam development, that Florida doesn't need to do that as well. They can trust that Excelsior can handle the weight of that or that Thomas Edison could handle the weight of that. And so you might want to speak more to that. Um, I would like to speak to that. Uh, I, as an assessment nerd, um, I have to say it's, it may not be rocket science. Michael talked about rocket science. But uh, I don't know that assessment science is quite that hard. But it is a science. It isn't just, I know the subject, and so I know how to ask people questions to find out if they learned it. It's more complicated than that. And in my experience, people who are experts in English literature or calculus or algebra aren't necessarily experts in how to assess what people know about all those subjects. So I get very concerned when I hear about, well, the colleges are just going to assess it themselves because the quality is going to be variable. Some of them will do a great job. Some of them are going to have people who really understand how to pull out the important things that the students need to know, and they're going to be able to capture that. They're going to be able to do it reliably, um, and that's going to be great. And then other places, it's going to be random, or the people are going to build bad tests, and nobody's going to be there to, to check on them. Can so, I ask, is there any quality control when colleges do their own challenge exams? Or who's looking over their shoulder? I have no idea. Now, it's possible that the accreditors do, but in my experience, accreditors aren't assessment experts either, necessarily, um, which, which isn't to say they should be. I don't think that's necessarily their job. The job of an accreditor, in my opinion, should be to make sure that the, pe the pieces are there to make sure that the institution is doing its job. But I think something like challenge exams tend to pass below the, the radar of accreditors because it's such a minor part of what goes on. If it now becomes a cornerstone or a mainstay of how education is going to work, it's going to need a lot more attention. It's going to deserve a lot more attention. And I'm not sure that accreditors or people out there know how to tell if it's being done right. And so to get back to Devin's point, I think there are a number of organizations, not a large number, but there are a number of organizations that really know how to do assessment. Um, and a lot of the assessments that are done are at scale. And by at scale, I mean our exams tend to be machine scored. So they're at scale in the sense that any number of people can take them, and it doesn't cost anything particularly to score them. But they're at scale in that sense. What LearningCounts.org does is at scale in the sense that they have very well thought out standards and procedures and rubrics that have to be gone through so that they have that assurance that even though the in, it may be an individual level assessment, the process can be trusted and the process is transparent and the process is something that experts have vetted and know is, is a decent process. So those are the experts. It's not uh, an exclusive club. Anybody can join that club. You just have to know how to do it. Um, and so what I would call for is we need to make sure that in California and Florida there ought to be standards 
how do you do assessments? If the schools choose to do it themselves, that's fine. I think it's a waste. I think if there are assessments out there for intro statistics, you don't need the school to do a challenge exam. They can take an intro statistics exam. There are plenty of them out there that are done by reputable organizations. Sure. Anyone else want to jump in on this? I'll, the only thing I would add is that the, uh, in, in either scenario, California or Florida, in a sense, it makes my job easier. Because what we're trying to do is allow students to earn credit for low, very low cost. So if you are going to draw a line in the sand that says this assessment will get you that credit, then we can work with experts to build a course to help students pass that assessment. Or vice versa, if we're going to say it's these learning objectives that are that make up this course. So you have to achieve these learning objectives and competencies in order to earn credit. And the institution that does that just has to you know, jump through a few hoops and become accredited either by the state um, or some other agency. That, that, that also makes it easy because we have a recipe to work from. So it's, it, if we could all get together, if all states got together, I think they would come into agreement in some cases of what college algebra looks like. Um, and that's, I think, is one of the problems currently is that it's a, an entirely fragmented uh, marketplace where everybody has their own ideal version of college algebra, which is incredibly inefficient and, and causes all sorts of redundancies. Um, with the Florida model, the, the only thing I would worry about is, um, is redundancy in, uh, in what the student has to pay. So I have to pay to learn, potentially, or I can do it for free. Um, but, the, but for free, still may need some additional resources. I may need to go spend time. I may need time and effort. Um, but then I also have to pay for this test, which could be a high-risk test. If I fail, what happens if I, you know, I'm out that money? Whereas the course way, um, you can learn towards mastery. You can, you can stop and say, oh, I don't get this concept yet. You know, how do I learn that? So, that's so just, just so folks are clear, because I often am not when it comes to what they're actually talking about here, because it is comp complicated stuff. Um, you know, we're talking about challenge exams that students take to prove their prior learning for credit. And um, a couple of the most common ones are Excelsior's exams and the CLEP exams that are offered by the College Board. And we're, we're talking $80, $90 a pop, so a, a pretty affordable way to credit. But you all brought up a, a point I think would make for a fun lightning round here. Um, when we're talking about standards, where could, should the feds get involved and help set standards for that? Everyone loves that question. Anyone? I don't think they're the right people. I, I, that's a, I hear that often. Um, but I think that gets to the question of encouraging innovation and preserving quality, which often seems to be at tension with this. Do, do you agree with that? Yeah, I think one thing that the feds could bring that individual schools couldn't is data collection. And if they're collecting data appropriately and actually giving statistics on when certain meeting certain learning outcomes translates into having certain skills or success in certain areas, then they can potentially better kind of reverse engineer what a good course is and what is a needed course. And they have a much larger sample to pull from, but then they can count on the people who are actually experts in developing the courses and the assessments to actually fit those models and perhaps. But there's a lot of bureaucracy and there's a lot of people not getting the right information. So there has to be a lot of teamwork. So let's, let's switch gears and go to open educational resources OER here um, in, in the place that it has in this. Um, you know, I, I talked to a student who used open educational resources to prepare for a CLEP test. He said he spent two weeks. It was free, obviously, because it was open. And he passed the test for $80. Um, where does fully open material play a role in being paired up with these assessments? And where does it not? I, I guess I'll, I'll start this, the lightning round, is that? No, no you can, no, no, you can, we're, we can <laughs> move on 30 bit. seconds or less. That went really fast. Um, well, you know, increasingly, I think um, prior learning assessment has been around for almost 40 years. And it has kind of a, a connotation of being really old and stodgy and conservative. But as more and more um, people gain access to the web and web resources and Sailor Foundation courses. Um, I think we're going to see younger and younger um, aged people, persons, trying to take advantage of this. Like right now, our average student is probably in their um, early 40s. But 
there's definitely going to be somebody at age 16 that's going to say, I want to be able to align my, my, what I've learned on my own because I was just interested in it to something that's going to be meaningful to an employer or to my future at college. So I, th I, think, it's, I think the OER, there's just like, there's so much potential. And it, right now it's a matter of kind of helping us all to align and be able to raise awareness around all the opportunities for demonstrating that learning and getting credit for that learning beyond the, the, the constant authenticity, uh, the authentication of who took the sailor course or not. It's just a matter of demonstrating the learning. And that's, that's a good point. In the California model, um, they're looking at about $140 for these courses that would be in this pool. And so let's say Coursera has a course in there or, or Udacity. That's no longer a MOOC. It might be a mock. Um, but you know, just so people are clear, that's that's not really fully open anymore, is it? In that, I, I wanted to follow up both on what Sherry said, and then also something Joe said in response to the last question. One thing I would say about OER, we we do align our exams with OER as fast as we can, but it's changing so fast that we can't we can't really keep up in the in the sense of. Do we know everything out there that's open that aligns with something in our exams? One of the reasons why we love working with Sailor is because they talk to us and we go back and forth and if they're going to change something, they let us know and if we're going to change something, we let them know and so we have a relationship. But most OER is just kind of random and it's really hard to say if somebody says, hey, if I went over here and took this OER, can I pass your test? So the second piece of that is what Joe was saying earlier, which is the um, learning outcomes are really crucial to all that. It's, it's the triangle. You've got the learning outcomes here. The OER are addressing the learning outcomes from this direction. Assessments are addressing them from this direction. And as long as everybody is clear on the learning outcomes, you should come out OK. So what that means is it's incumbent on providers of assessments to say, here are the learning outcomes that are associated with this assessment. You pass this assessment. This is what it says about what you know. And then at the same time, providers of OER can say, here's what you're going to learn using these resources. This is, what we're, or this is what we're trying to get you to learn using these resources. And that way, the consumers, users, whatever you want to call them, the learners can say, OK, if I want to get credit for, and I'll say statistics, if I want to get credit for statistics, um, I can go to the exams content guide, which is freely available. Um, this is true of most of the large-scale exams. Or you can look at the content guide and see what the learning outcomes are. So I can see what I need to know. Um, I can use these OER resources, and they should be telling me what the outcomes are so I can learn those. And then as long as all of that is, is clear and open and transparent, then I think everything works out well. I think the problem is a lot of open resources are just, hey, I put this up because it's cool, and nobody's doing the extra work that it takes to put up clear learning objectives, which is fine. Open should be open, and there shouldn't be extra regulations on it. Openness is part of the, part of the charm. Um, but that's, those learning objectives are what's going to enable people to do the matching work. Sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, um, getting back maybe a little bit to your question, I, I think that um, OER works very well with certain higher ed models, uh, one that's really learning outcomes based, as Mika's talking about, uh, where what you're really thinking about in granting a credential is something like, well, the person who's got this credential is able to do this, this, and this, and has these skills and has this knowledge. It doesn't work very well with the, the, the more traditional model that, uh, uh, in which a, a college or a university sees itself as somehow branding or leaving its stamp on its students. So, so you don't come out of Harvard if the majority of your courses were through OER, a Harvard man, in the way that you might have if you'd sat through all those lectures. Um, so that, that's something that's missing, and I guess people can decide whether or not there's a value to that. And I think for some people it's out of their reach, you know, or it's not practical, it's not what they want. Um, what we uh, do for, with, with OER is something that's more f the learning outcomes uh, focused model, where um, uh, our students are all adult students. That's, that's really what our focus is. And there are a few schools like us, in the, mostly in the Northeast, that are um, only open essentially to adult students. And so we assume that they come in uh, with a certain amount of knowledge that they've picked up from various places. 
Um, however, what, what we find over and over is that the knowledge that they come um, to Thomas Edison with is not neatly packaged in um, three credit uh, bite-sized pieces. You know, they might know two credits worth of a subject or seven credits, or they might know the practical side of it, but not the theory side that overlays it. And so what we're um, thinking about in, um, in regard to OER is saying to a student, all right, well, this is what you've brought us. Here's the gap between that and the courses that we offer, the, the curriculum that we offer, which is still very much course-based. Um, so you can turn to OER to color in, you know, to fill in those missing gaps. Um, now, it does change rapidly, but we're thinking more, uh, you know, and so, so the thing that we thought we knew was true of that particular MOOC is no longer true. But um, we're looking at it as more of a uh, just-in-time model. You know, so you're coming to us now and you're saying, I've got this knowledge, and so we will research what's out there and say, well, here's something that might fit. You know, it, it, it's not itself the, uh, the final product that we want you to have, but it'll get you ready for an assessment, uh, which will then measure your skills and knowledge. And so um, some of the sailor courses work very well um, uh, in that regard for us. Can I, can I just add one more thing? Um, to put in a plug for uh, OER University. Um, I don't know if people have heard of this, but it's a consortium which includes Thomas Edison and Excelsior um, that's committed to providing credentials primarily based on OER where the members provide OER, but then they also commit to trying to find ways to get credible assessments for that OER so that you can build up a degree that comes from your home institution, but that's based on assessments, which are in turn based on learning that was gained through OER. Sure. So that's a neat initiative to, to look at. Devin, you were going to? Yeah. Uh, just, and they've kind of mentioned this, but I wanted to reinforce what I kind of believe to be one of the strengths of Sailor courses and why our courses work so well with the assessment models that they have is one, just the nature of openness and that the courses themselves are transparent and individuals who are looking to build assessments have a much clearer picture of what our courses teach to. And also the fact that we've taken the approach of we've designated the learning outcomes that we think are needed. And even if we change the content, we're not going to change the learning outcomes. We're going to find the best open content to continue to teach those learning outcomes. So even if our courses change, and our courses do change because we have now a mission to be 100% open resources, that we know that our students can still take that same course and still pass that same assessment that is really validating the learning outcomes that we're building too. So it kind of makes us more flexible and able to work with these individuals on a long-term scale. So I think uh, it's probably fair to say that a lot of the energy for all of this, the, the interest in adult students, but traditional age students too, to be able to be tested for what they know and receive credit for it, um, and to, to, to basically test out of courses um, or to, to learn at their own pace um, is driven in part by concerns about the cost for, of college, as we've heard, and the time to degree and uh, training our workforce. It might surprise you all to hear, though, that some people are not that excited about all this. Um, and I, I encounter um, people who are very skeptical every day. Um, I actually wrote a story today about Thomas Edison um, having a really interesting partnership with a community college in New Jersey, Warren County, to create a degree track for veterans. And um, it's, it's a really cool story. Um, not the story that I wrote, but what they're doing. Um, but they basically allow veterans to qualify for credits from their training and experience up to, what, 30-some, and then up to 45, even, if it pairs directly with courses. Okay. So I knew what would happen. Immediately, people began criticizing this. Um, and one of the first critiques I saw it, the, the community college actually sent its president to boot camp on Paris Island for a week to kind of get a sense for what the training was like and what the training was like in terms of credit. And the, the Marine Corps' basic training under ACE credit guidelines is eight credits, eight college credits. And they were impressed with the, the level of depth, the learning outcomes in the Marine Corps' training. Some of our readers thought eight credits for the Marine Corps training? Come on, pull-ups, what, what's up with that? And I don't think that's fair. But I'm just saying, what, what do you all say to critics who don't believe that non-credit learning should count for substantial credits? How many pull-ups? <laughs> <laughs> Probably a lot. Yeah. 
But often that comes from ignorance. I mean, I'm not trying to put any red flag words out there, but a lot of it comes from ignorance and um, it comes from just not even really knowing what we're talking about or the science that goes behind um, what we're trying to do. Um, and, it, and it comes from wanting to maintain the status quo to be able to keep higher ed the way it is. With, where you have the experts, the sage on the stage, you have you know, all of the, the things that you have to do to prereqs, to you know, be able to get into the course, and, and all of the different gatekeepers along the way. And it's, it's concerning because um, that particular model, which actually up until maybe the last year or so, is the one that most of our policymakers in Washington and even in state government, they had all gone through the traditional way, like they may have gone to Harvard, they may have you know, had elite educations. And therefore, they never once gave a thought to people who don't always go down the same pathway. And so I think when you see that kind of criticism, when we're trying to help people um, to get validated and, and move forward and have pathways, I think it's really unfortunate. Yeah. No, I, I think. Um if I'm not mistaken, most of that um, training was reviewed, not, not by us in this case, but the American Council on Education. Correct. Yeah, yeah. And, and their members include, was it 1,600 uh, yeah. colleges, All right? The big ones, yeah. Yeah, the elites as well as, you know, and everyone else. And, and uh, um, the, the, the concept behind that, it, maybe this is a group that already knows this, but um, uh, is that they've already learned through this training, whether it's uh, military or otherwise, um, something that they would only have to duplicate in a classroom, you know? and, and I would say there are some people who would say that learning that you get through experience is actually of more value than something you get in a classroom. I'm not sure if that's the conversation we want to have now, but um, uh, because they really internalize it and they really know it. And so to have that person come out of that training and then sit in a classroom and go through the textbook version of what they just did seems pretty silly, it, you know. It, and uh, uh, so all all this program and all ACE is doing is just acknowledging that for them, and they they do it by mapping this training to learning outcomes and all the other standards that they find in college courses. It's a pretty rigorous pro process, I would say. Yeah, I think part of the problem and the stigma and the lack of adoption is schools and individual <laughs> teachers not really understanding the process <coughs> behind a CE rec credit recommendation and CCRS credit recommendation and not knowing the fact that it's their colleagues, it's actual college professors and subject matter experts who are validating this learning and are just doing it on a wider scale so that they don't have to do it again. And if you look at regional accreditation and some of the things that go into a school being regionally accredited, it has nothing to do with the actual quality of the individual courses and what's being taught in those individual courses. They're saying <coughs> that the institution is being trusted to teach good courses, but they're not necessarily always speaking to the course. Whereas with ACE and NCCRS, they're actually looking at the individual learning that is taking place and making a valid judgment on whether or not other schools should accept that for credit. And I think once that becomes a little bit more widespread, and I know our colleagues here, Tina, are doing a really good job of kind of spreading that message. Um, but I think that's an important thing that needs to be reinforced is that who is kind of doing that, making that recommendation, and why other people should trust it. Wait, would you actually explain briefly what Tina's shop does, so, so folks here? See, I knew this would happen. <laughs> or Tina um, can. <laughs> I think all of us probably can in some aspect. But so I'll speak specifically to the three courses that we put through review. Perfect. Um, so we kind of reached out to Tina and NCCRS to see what would need to be done with our courses to have them reviewed and recommended for college credit. And we spent a good amount of time kind of beefing up those courses and building strong assessments for those courses and ensuring that students would be learning what needs to be learned in the equivalent of that college course and being assessed appropriately for it. And when it came time for, for review, NCCRS came to the actual Sailor Foundations and brought with them actual professors of these courses to kind of go through our entire course and our assessment with a fine tooth comb, ask us questions about why we did certain things, and look questions and asked us about how they're being assessed so that they could understand that the material that we're teaching to and the assessment that is being used to validate that learning is just as strong as any exam that they would give in their own course in the, in the classroom that they gave so that they could feel safe saying, yes, this course is worth three college credits. Sure. And luckily, we've had 
partners like Thomas Edison and Excelsior who understand that process and now allow our students to take that course from us and transfer that credit to those institutions and save a significant amount of money. So I want to open up to questions in a second, but um, I'm going to ask a, another really easy question. Um, I think a lot of these uh, innovations challenge the credit hour. Um, and, and I think um, a lot of people view the credit hour as a barrier to, to going further with self-paced learning. Um, what do you all think? Do you, do you think that it's time to revisit the credit hour and its application to higher education? I, so there was an easy one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was being sarcastic. So we, we field a lot of calls at Straderline where students ask, well, you know, how, what's the average time it takes for a student to finish a course? And um, in general, we say around 40 days. That's kind of indicative of any of our courses. Many will take longer, some will take shorter, but it all really depends on the student and the student's prior experience, their aptitude to learning, their aptitude for online learning, uh, the quality of the resources that we're providing, their um, ability to use or leverage some of the support resources that we're providing. It really is all dependent on the learner these days. But the semester credit hour is based on this kind of number picked out of the air that's hundreds of years old and it says you have 16 hours of classroom time and that's what, you know, three of those equals a semester and mm -hmm. you add all those up and you get 120 and you get a degree. And then, but it's, so it's a, uh, it's arbitrary in a sense, but if the, uh, there's not a good alternative um, currently. Um, and to be honest, it's, if it were predicated on some other, um, some other thing, what learning objectives, they would, I, they being, I think if we were to come to agreement and put people at the table and say, come up with an alternative, it would be based on the semester hour. What, how, what, what's the number of competencies or the um, quantify what's learned in a semester hour and then let's turn that into the new currency and I don't have another alternative. Yeah, I, I would just say that uh, it's not the credit hour that's the issue as much for me as, uh, as the fact that the credit hours are designed to measure courses. Uh, you know, uh, it, as Joe's saying, if, if you could tie those uh, credit hours to competencies or to the kinds of things that you want somebody to know when they've completed a degree, that's fine. But right now, our degrees are based on the fact that somebody got a passing grade in 40 courses. And I don't know that that, just knowing that is enough to tell me that that person has any skills, except that they know how to cram for tests and, and things like that. And, and to me, that's where the issue is with the credit hour. What, each of those is worth three credits. And it's not really building toward anything. Uh, um, I think that's really where the drawback is. It, because anything you replace credit hours with is going to also be arbitrary in some way. You know, it's just going to be all the little building blocks, like the sort of Lego pieces that add up to the degree. Um, you know, you have to count it somehow, I suppose. Sure. Yeah. Sherry, did you want to? Uh, yes, I think one of the things that's, um, that's been a reinforcement of the credit hour is Title IV funding. And when you looked at the numbers on the screen around student, student loan, um, student indebtedness um, when they graduate, for many of our, what we do here, uh, it, because it's based upon assessment, it is ineligible for Title IV funding. So um, in order to kind of help to really truly innovate and move to more competency-based, um, you know, show us what you know, show us what you can do, kinds of degrees where employers can really actually see what they're hiring beyond the brand name of the institution, um, then it's gonna continue to be like this. We, we need to have you know, and I know we have a lot of uh, think tanks that are considering this. You know, how would we be able to award um, financial aid for students um, who are going to be taking an exam or students who are going to be going through learning counts for an assessment? And I, I saw the, uh, a very interesting outcome of legislation in Tennessee where they've gone to performance-based funding um, for all their public uh, institutions and uh, community colleges, the Board of Regents system, and the UT system. And because they've gone to performance-based funding, they actually get additional funding for students who are making uh, pro progress, who surpass milestones. And by getting credit through examinations, um, through learning counts, by actually acknowledging prior learning assessment, faculty members who really weren't supportive of that before are becoming supportive. 
deans and administrators are getting very interested in that because they could take a funding dip if they aren't, you know, actually being moving people on to degrees faster um, and being more um, productive in terms of the output. So that's another. I think the whole incentive system is weird right now sure. for credit hours. And sure, it's kind of briefly touched on this. Speak up your mic. Sorry, uh, but one of the other important aspects I think is from the employer end. Part of the reason why I think it's still credit hour and degree based is because employers continue to take a degree at face value. And they look at a resume and see, oh, this person graduated from this college, that must mean something. If they kind of try to flip that on its head themselves and start saying, no, I need to see a more detailed report of what these individuals have actually learned that you're sending to me, then that can force it to be broken down into more competencies and to reevaluate the way that you structure the degree and also be able help break down courses where there's overlap so that if you're taking one course that or two courses that cover half, half the material the same then perhaps don't view that as six credit hours view that as one and a half courses worth of information learned and kind of be able to detail those learning outcomes then that could be more useful but I think a lot of that effort needs to be done on the employer end of saying these are exactly the type of employees that I want and universities and colleges have been around for a while to serve the economy and the employment force, so they kind of need to have back and forth conversation on that. So I'm gonna, um, I wanna turn it over to the audience here in a second, but I'm gonna be a big stickler on this lightning round, so I really mean like 10 seconds here. Um, you, you kick off, I think, an interesting question, how big can this get? Um, you know, in, in the context of, I think most people don't realize this, 20% of American higher education ballpark is the traditional residential college student. The norm is the non-traditional student. But, but how, how big do you think these innovations can get? And it's hard for me to call them innovations when they've been around for 40 years. But prior learning assessment, competency-based education, wh where do you see the movement going? And we'll start with Sherry. Oh, um, actually, um, because the movement's been around for so long, and you know, we say we're, we're finally in the spotlight, I think as long as we really take advantage and work together to, you know, whether it's the badging movement or competencies or credit hours or Sailor Foundation courses, um, examinations, I think that we could really, this could go very far, actually. Okay. It's making people think about learning differently. Okay. I would agree with Sherry. California is a big place. Um, I think as people start thinking about competencies rather than just seat time, that's going to be the, the key that turns the lock. Joe? Um, to be honest, I think that what's the indicator is going to be how many students have transfer credits. And I would, we can hope for 100% of students in the future having some transfer credits that they either got for free or for very cheaply. That, that would be uh, mission accomplished. Mm. Hey, um, I, I think there's really two pieces to what you said, but I'm just going to give them five seconds each. Uh, <laughs> Oh. <laughs> when is the, the prof um, when we talk about competency-based learning, professional schools already do that. That that's that, this is really an innovation only for the liberal arts. You know, our nursing school does that at the applied science school. It, it, this is not an issue for them. The other piece, as far as uh, prior learning assessments concerned, I think it's really going to take somebody doing some studies. Uh, you know, somebody who gets a degree that's primarily accomplished through prior learning assessment. What do they then go on to do? How skilled are they? You, you know, how do they compare to people who? Yeah, yeah exactly. We haven't done that yet. Yeah, I think we're taking steps in the right direction, and California is proving that by even considering this bill. Um, and the other one that they have on the table of having a fifth type of university system of just going for assessment, which actually, if any of you were at the summit last year, Michael had that idea and told Virginia to do it. Um, but California, I guess, came around to doing it first. But as Mark said, we also need time and we need data in order to support these models. So if California goes ahead and does it, and then they start producing a better caliber employee than other states, then that is a marketable, marketable thing, and that will kind of hopefully resonate. I'm sorry. Yeah, the thing about California, I just want to mention, the things that are going on in California, Tennessee, Wisconsin, uh, and Florida, they're really based on money, though. They're, they're, they're not based on improving the quality or making things more accessible to students. They're just like, how do we get them out cheaper? And, and that's a very or, different... Or capacity that's not being met. California's work. Well, yeah, and so so rather than build new campuses, let's let's do this, you know. Right. Um, and and I, that's not really addressing the same issues that that our institutions, our programs. Are
just want to address that. All right, so um, I'm, I'm under a spotlight. I can't really see you too well here, but um, I, okay, I see one hand back there. Speak up, please. Hi, um, my name is Doug Mellinger. Um, you guys, I've heard a lot about what you, know, what you guys are, are talking about. I'm on the board of two colleges out in California, and one's a nationally accredited board certificate and associate degree program, and the other one is a bachelor and master's degree. And one of the things that uh, I've seen out there is that the vast majority of the students that are applying and the ones that even get in are completely unprepared to come to college. You know, the, the remedial uh, math that has to be given because of what they're getting in high school is absolutely staggering uh, what we've had to do out there. Um, when I think about what you said, Mark, Particular, you know, was, was interesting to me because you know, when, I, when I think about this country, the number of people who ever step foot in a college is pathetic, and the number of people who actually ever get any sort of degree is absolutely ridiculous. And so, you know, we're, we're not, I'm not really hearing about how we're going to deal with the vast majority of people who really never are taking access to education and the outcome of actually preparing people for jobs, where we've got millions of jobs in this country that are available with nobody to take them, because the skill sets are not matching. And so, you know, I just think the whole system is completely broken, and I haven't heard a lot of kind of the real fundamental problems coming out of this. So I'd love to get your guys' thoughts on, you know, what do we need to do to actually start solving some of this problem? I think this competency is very interesting, but how is that going to match up? Well, in my opinion, one of the problems with that is colleges and universities taking on the burden of remedial education themselves. There are tons of resources out there that students could use to learn remedial courses, but what usually happens is students will go to a college and be forced to take a test and then be told that they then have to, at that college, take a remedial course, which if they don't pass, they can't move on to take other courses instead of colleges and universities directing those students to free alternatives to better prepare themselves for those resources and then be able to come back when they are prepared and do have the skills necessary to actually achieve what the college wants them to achieve. And I think one of, that's one of the big issues is that so much money and so much time is getting spent on colleges not doing what their actual major skill set is, which is the higher level learning and the other resources that go around it, and reteaching what is being taught or what should have been taught in high schools. So I think they need to spread out some of that burden and make use of the free education providers and the other resources that are available to them and kind of better guide students in order to better suit their needs and make, set them up to be more successful. Anyone else? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, the, uh, I, I know the, uh, well, there's again, two parts to your question, but uh, the second piece, the AACNU has done a number of surveys, I guess, with uh, Peter Hart um, of, of employers asking them what kinds of skills they want. And those surveys never say, I want somebody to have 12 credits in math. You know, they, they say, I, I want somebody who knows uh, how to communicate effectively, ethics, uh, global perspective, and things like that. And, and, and um, it's a question, really, it's something that can't really be addressed by the current system. It's something that some of these more competency-based programs or ones that are focused on those specific learning outcomes are the only ones that can get close to that. Um, it, it's, it's hard to convince people who are used to teaching their specific subject and their specific disciplines that what's really needed is, is a better alignment with uh, what students are going to be doing after they finish school. Um, as, far as, uh, as far as remedial work is concerned, uh, Thomas Edison State College offers no remedial courses at all. Uh, we consider our students to be self-directed adults. That's the phrase we, we toss around all the time. Um, but we've been looking at OER as an option, you know, especially OER that's self-paced, uh, you know, where students can take as long as they want or, or you know, and, and kind of focus on different areas uh, as, as they prefer. You know, and then once they've gotten that to a place where they feel comfortable, then they can enter. I, I'm not sure that would be the solution for everybody. But as uh, Devin said, there, there are all kinds of open resources out there that address those kinds of things. A bridge to success is the one that comes to mind right now, but I know there are dozens of others. I see a hand over here. 
Um, isn't one of the problems to get to kind of the first part of that, that question, what you were addressing, just a complete lack of um, interaction or collaboration on curriculum and development certification between the employer and the educational system. It seems like the the bubble of OER or the bubble of educational resources still gets caught inside its own thought as opposed to making that connection with a properly employed, employable workforce. That's what Cor I know Coursera was planning to to work directly with employers to develop courses that uh, would address these specific issues. I don't I don't I wouldn't know if others are, but I, yeah, I would can throw in there. But Cherry, yeah. uh, I was just going to say that you know certainly community colleges work all the time with their local employers to figure out you know what they're looking for and what they need. But I what they need. I, I think that for me anyway, the bigger issue is we certainly wouldn't be talking about uh, MOOCs if they weren't being offered by prestige institutions. You know, a lot of us that have been in the, in the field forever, you know, if, if one of our colleges or universities put up a massive open online course that had maybe a 10% success rate, um, we, would, we would be laughed right out of higher ed and would be really on the fringe. And I think what it points to is this huge digital divide in our country of uh, the haves and the have-nots um, and our aspiration to you know be able to taste a little bit of MIT or Harvard through a MOOC um, but we have students who come to us one in particular I can think of right off the bat who is homeless she's living in a shelter she's driving to a library to get internet access um, when you talk about the disconnect with developmental education because the K-12 hasn't done its job you really have to begin to do more than just lip service, think of the P16 system and better align the quality of education throughout the system. And we've been so decentralized and have so many fiefdoms that um, I totally agree that it is broken, but I think we have a lot of smart people that are really trying to think about ways to make it better. So let's do one more question. And um, while we're doing that, um, this is not an endorsement, but we haven't talked about two of the big players in digital. Uh, the University of Phoenix, I hear from a lot of employers, does some of the best work in terms of structuring degrees around competencies that employers prefer, um, as do community colleges. And uh, Pearson has been working on uh, digital developmental products for a long time as well. So uh, any, okay, I see one back there to the left. That's you, yeah. Uh, John Edelson, California State University, Monterey Bay. I think I attended some of those faculty meetings in California that the first speakers spoke about. Um, also with an ePortfolio California project. We were a, an outcomes-based campus that really moved away from high-stakes testing to outcomes and portfolios. I see the movement with MOOCs and some of the things you describing is really going more towards high-stakes testing and limited uh, testing that doesn't provide as rich of an understanding. And um, testing, high-stakes testing has worked so well with Leave No Child Left Untested. Um, yes. What are your thoughts about you know other alternatives to high state testing and portfolios? I think high stakes testing. It's it sounds like when you're talking about high stakes testing, you're talking about the heavily standardized testing. All I would consider testing that leads to a college credential to be high stakes, whether it's a portfolio, an essay. A, term paper, anything like that. But to get to what I think you're asking, when you're talking about a multiple choice machine scored exam determining um, the fate of a student versus are they doing a portfolio, are they doing something more interactive, I think there are all kinds of good assessments and there are all kinds of bad assessments. And it's possible for just about any type of assessment to be either good or bad. There are a lot of bad multiple choice tests out there. There are a lot of good ones. There are a lot of bad portfolio evaluators out there, there are a lot of good ones. So part of the trick is not to make sure that what you're assessing is really what you want to be assessing and that whoever is designing the assessments is finding the right way to get at what you want to assess. If you want to assess whether somebody can marshal a bunch of facts taken from many different sources and write a coherent argument, Right now, the technology doesn't exist to score that by machine. 
So having somebody try to do a machine scorable essay or a multiple choice test is not going to be a good way to assess that particular competency if that's what you're interested in. So then you have to get to something that's more expensive that probably involves humans. Um, but even there, you just because it involves humans doesn't mean it's high quality because then you have reliability problems. So I think the trick is to have an increased awareness of the appropriate and inappropriate roles for assessment and to make sure that people who understand that are designing the right assessments for the purposes that they're purportedly for. So we're going to wrap it up on that. Um, please join with me in thanking our panelists for an excellent session. Thank you.